Many, many years ago, there was a song by um, Brian Adams that was, uh, cuts like a knife, but it feels so good. And there's part of this book of Philippians that I think Paul might almost hum that part, because he is uh, in suffering when he writes this book. We're going to talk about that as we get into it. But it's a book that is just filled with joy. I think it's something like 10 times in the course of the book, he will either talk about joy or tell his uh, readers that they're to rejoice. So it's always an interesting book that way, written from prison, all these things going on, about to go into trial, marked by joy. And um, that's where we're going to be heading into. So we're starting a sermon series today where we're going to go through the entire book letter to the Philippians. And um, it's a book that has four chapters. We're going to spend five weeks going through it. And uh, I think it's something we need to occasionally do is just stop and drill down on one particular book. I think for us as Episcopalians, sometimes we get lots of Scripture, but we don't always get it like this, in one piece going deep. And the thing about the lectionary is I'm convinced that it really the lectionary goes back to times when people were much, much more versed in the Bible. And when you got like, you know, this one piece, you immediately could remember the whole book and what's going on and lots more details in it. And we're not always that way today. So I think it's great. To, to do these five weeks looking at this. And I've said this before, but for me also, I can speak firsthand that the more Scripture we take in at a deep level, I think the more we grow. And in the past, I've challenged people to read the Bible, um, you know, in, in a, on a two-year cycle or something, and they'll come back and say, wow, that really changed me. I know for me, the first time I, I read the New Testament um, from cover to cover, all in one go, um, was a year of most growth for me. So it was a, it was a tremendous year. So I really want to encourage us to use this as a chance for you to read Philippians on your own, cover to cover with us, and be looking at it and studying it as we, as we kind of go through it. Uh, what I'd like to do today, though, is uh, as we start into this, I want to set the stage for this book um, as we get going on it. I want to go through the introductory piece of it, and I want to start just the very beginning of the body of the work itself. As we look at it. So, and before we really even get to any of that, I want to just pause for a second and talk about how we read Scripture, because we don't always talk a whole lot about that. I mean, I think at the most basic level, we talk about, um, you know, reading Scripture and sort of asking three questions. This is like the most basic way of reading it, of asking what it says, what's it mean, and kind of why it matters. Like, what, how's it relate to me now? Those are kind of the three things. And I think that's like the, a really basic way of reading it. And then I always mention, too, that, uh, that there are other ways to read it. One of the other ways that came out of post-enlightenment um, was to read it with what are called her, his, historical critical methods. And I always mention this because when I got to seminary, there were people who had never seen any of this done that were so wigged out by it that I feel like as a church where people are invited to bring their brains that I ought to say something about that. And, and Oliver and I do this whenever we're preaching. We're looking at what are called historical... We're looking at what the um, historians are saying about this and what genre it is and what, who is it really written to and what was there. All this stuff affects how you interpret it. And, you know, like I remember particularly in seminary when people... I always use this as an example, but when we got to studying Genesis and then you get into it and you suddenly know that all the biblical scholars and most all the seminaries of the world think there were three different authors... Of, the, of Genesis, and they got edited and put together while they're on the Babylonian exile and all this kind of stuff. Some people are like, oh my gosh, God is still the author. We're all just talking about how it gets made, and if it's too much of the sausage being made for you, that's okay, but I want you to know, don't look behind the veil unless you want to see it being made, and it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> that's historical critical method. I think the third way is what some of the old fathers of the church called spiritual reading, which I like. Spiritual reading is sort of just reading it, and don't worry about it. Just read it. And don't worry about what, you know, the experts are saying on this or that. As long as you're not out to make doctrine, just read it. Don't worry about it. Don't be saying, I don't really understand what that means. I'm going on to the next verse. Just keep going and just see how God is speaking to you through it. But kind of hold it a little bit loosely because if you were ever going to start really honing in what you believed, you'd want to know what St. Augustine thought about it. And you'd want to know what the biblical scholars had said. And you'd want to bring in the whole company of the church through the ages on the various passages and what you believe. But for most of us, the important thing is just to read it, and then God will use it, right? I think that's a really important thing. Well, as we start to set the stage, um, so we're going to be spending these five weeks talking about the Philippians. The initial question is just to ask 
about this city of Philippi where Paul is writing this letter to the Christians that are at Philippi. And who are they? Like, what is this city? And, uh, you know, so this is going to be the very first church in Europe. So now this is the first time the gospel we're seeing Paul come into a part of Europe. So we're looking at northern Greece. We're looking at um, a, a city that is about 10 miles in from the coast, uh, from the port city of Neapolis. And um, it's a, it is a city that is on one of the major Roman highways that goes across Macedonia, uh, the Ignatian Way. And significant to all of this, it's a prominent Roman colony. So back in the year 42 B.C., back when you have um, Octavius and, and uh, Mark Anthony defeating some of Caesar's uh, assassins, this is where eventually a bunch of the soldiers settled in Philippi. So it's got a big Roman, uh, a lot of people are descendants of Roman soldiers that had decided to live there. Latin is the common language. So you kind of get in a picture of that's the, the city that we're talking about. And it's likely that Paul wanted to start there because it was a prominent Roman city. He's a Roman citizen. He's looking at the map. That's where he wants to go and start his journey. And uh, so I, along with that, we might ask, you know, more specifically, how did he get there? Like, give us, how did Paul end up originally establishing a relationship with the Philippians so that later he writes to them? He's writing to them later as a church he loves. A lot of people think this is the church he loved the most. So the question is, how did he get there, and how did this relationship begin? And to answer that, we, we, in our first reading today, we got a bit of Acts 16. But the passage right before that is one where we get the story of how they ended up there. Because Paul is, um, many of y'all will know, Paul had three missionary journeys. And on the second missionary journey, he's over in Asia Minor, and he's planning, he wants to go through Galatia and Bithynia, and he has this night where he goes to sleep, and in his sleep he encounters the Spirit, this man who comes to him in the night, who tells him, come over to us and help us um, over in Macedonia. And so he, get, he takes that as a, a word from God. And they get up and they travel across the water and they head over and they land at Neapolis and then they head in on this uh, Ignatian Way, this big Roman highway. And then they land. And that's where they get. And the, um, the question that, that comes up then is, well, what happened? Like, how did we end up with a church? What happens? So we get that in our reading that we had today from Acts 16. So Paul shows up in Philippi. And there, you know, you'll read Paul's um, various missionary journeys and what he does. He very frequently would go to the synagogue first. Philippi didn't have a synagogue. So he's heard that on the Sabbath, there are people out by the river that are worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's where he goes. And it's a bunch of women. And he goes out there, and when he's out there, he's presenting the gospel and talking about what God has done in this tradition and where it goes. And in the course of that, one of the women, Lydia, who is the one who sells purple goods, she um, converts. And they didn't have a long baptismal course because he baptizes her right there in the river. And then she offers up her home for whatever they need. And that's how the first church in Europe began. And, um, and that's, that's where it starts. Now, it's interesting that um, they're only there for a few days, best we can tell. It's not a long stay that he has in Philippi. But that's how it all starts. And that's what takes place. And that is, you know, presumptively we read later where other people convert and the church is growing from there. That Paul has got this special place for them. He talks about holding them in his heart. He talks about how he yearns to be with them. He has this special thing with the Philippians. And that's why a lot of people think it's his favorite church. But what happens to him next? Like, how does this little, how does this little part of this story end? It's not a real happy ending, if you've read on. So the passage we have um, today that we read in Acts, the very next part of Acts, in Acts 16, tells you what happens and it's not a, like I say, it's not a pretty story. So what happens is Paul is going around town telling people about the gospel. And along the way, there's this um, little slave girl that starts following them. 
And she has a spirit that allows her to discern spirit or uh, um, do soothsaying and tell things like this. And she runs around next to Paul and, um, and Silas and keeps saying, these are men of God. They're here to tell you about salvation or whatever. They, they know that one true God and are going to tell you about how to find salvation. And they keep doing this and they keep doing this. And finally, Paul gets worn down and gets irritated and says, look, he turns around and commands the spirit to leave. And the spirit leaves the woman and she can no longer do her soothsaying, which was making money for her owners. And so who gets upset? The owners. So the owners haul off and take um, Paul and Silas to the magistrates, who then promptly strip, beat, and imprison them. And so uh, later on in, in another work, in um, 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks about what happens in Philippi, and he says, when we suffered and were shamefully treated. And after the magistrates get to where they understand that Paul is a Roman citizen, he's got some rights and things, they're apologizing for what they've done, but they tell him, look, help us out. Why don't you just go on? So, so Paul leaves Philippi. So his stay there is, is quite short, right? But it has a profound uh, impact, and he, he develops this bond with the Philippians there. And, and you can hear it in this letter that he writes to them, um, and you get all that. I think the final thing about setting the stage for this book is to just simply ask the question, where was it written from and when? And this is a short answer. Nobody knows. Um, nobody knows for sure. If you go read the best academic works, they're going to give you about four or five theories. And I can tell you that the majority of scholars think it was written from Ephesus. Uh, and we know he's in prison. We know he's about to go to trial. They think he's in Ephesus. And there are a number of reasons why they think that. So if you hear me talk about it being written from Ephesus, I'm kind of buying that. But there are, there's a variety of opinions on that, and nobody knows for sure. So with that, I want to um, turn and begin to actually look at this uh, letter itself. And as we make the turn to actually start to look at Philippians, um, and one thing to let you know as we get into this series, starting this next week, we're going to skip the first reading. And for the next uh, four weeks, we're going to include the reading as part of the sermon. And so today we're going to be reading um, Philippians as well. But as we turn to it, um, I want to mention that something that many of you already know, that at the time they would have written this letter, it was following a certain format. And the easy way to think about this, the, the uh, Greco-Roman letters, you can think about an email today, right? If you're going to write an email, it's going to have a format. It's going to have the to, the from, the date, the subject line, and then the, t- you know, then the text. Well, they had a particular format as well. And there were four parts to it. There was this introductory formula. We're going to cover that today on this letter. Then there was a Thanksgiving section. We're going to cover that today. Then there was the body, which was the main um, part of the text that would go on what they were covering. And then there was a concluding uh, formula, right? So we're starting out now looking at this introductory formula. And the introductory formula had three parts to it. Um, It was the sender, the addressee, and then a greeting. And you're going to hear that. So let me start by just reading the first two um, verses Um, of Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul begins with this, again, following straight down the formula, but he makes a number of important modifications to it. And one of the things about Paul is he's... um, clever enough that a lot of times you can get what the whole book is about by his introductory formula. You can get hints or even the whole theme of the book. And there's a couple of hints in here about where he's going to go with this whole letter. Um, the beginning place, he makes one modification. He doesn't, just say, he doesn't just say Paul and Timothy. He adds in this word servants. And the word he's using in the Greek is actually slaves. He's saying, you know, hey, we're, we're slaves to Jesus Christ. We're slaves of Jesus Christ. And he's striking a tone of humility in that. And that's going to be one of the themes that carries through the whole, this whole letter, is his emphasizing humility as one way to maintain unity. 
in the church. That's one of the things that's going to keep coming up. And along with that, he talks about, um, he dresses, there's only three of his letters. You know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. There are only three of his letters where when he's doing his introduction, where he addresses it to everyone. He says to all. And this is one of those. And I think part of that, he's not just writing it to, to the people who have particular titles, but it's to everybody. So he's writing it to everybody, and he's writing it from the slave. And again, he's trying to um, strike this thing of humility and along with that unity. And he calls them saints um, along the way. It's to all of them, but it's saints. He wants everybody to get that they're part of the saints. Again, um, this move towards um, his unity in that way. So in the beginning of this thing, he models an interest uh, of others, of putting the interest of others before one's own self. And then he reminds them that they're saints as this call to unity. So you get these two things signaled right up front. And then he moves on to the second piece of the way these letters went. And that was the Thanksgiving piece. And usually what this was back in this genre is um, everybody believed in gods, right? So it didn't matter who was writing. The second section was this Thanksgiving and they would give thanks to the gods, of course, Paul is going to change that and give thanks to God, but he's also going to modify it in that he's going to make intercessions for them and say what those are. So let me read, uh, let me read on. This is going to be verses 3 to 8. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy, thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel thus about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with affection of Christ Jesus. So he, he has this Thanksgiving section where he's giving thanks for them, but he's doing more than that. He's also, he's, make, he's doing two things that are different modifications. One is he's adding these intercessions where he's telling them exactly how he's praying for them. And then he also talks about how he's doing it with joy. So we get the first occasion in this book where he's going to use the word joy. And I think he wants to explain to them why it is that he has so much joy. And so he begins to list out these things for which he's grateful for and these things that are giving him joy. And so he talks about um, how joyful he is about their partnering and their support for him. So if you don't know this, um, they, have, they have brought economic um, support to him and other kinds of support in sending somebody to him while he's in prison. So they, they have gone out of their way to help him and sent Aphrodite and what have you. He's joyful that he's confident that what God started in them, this working of grace, this church, all this, God is going to continue them on the path. He's going to continue them and grow them on this ongoing journey. He is grateful and joyful that they're united. So he's listing all that out for them. Um, and then we, get, um, we go on and we get the rest of his intercessions. So let me read on for a minute. This is going to be verses 9 to 11. And it is my prayer, so he's going to tell them what he's praying, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness which come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he goes on to actually let him know what he's praying about and, and where he is on all of this. And he, he says that his requests are that God would uh, continue to grow this love in them, that this love would abound in them. And sort of the, the things he, he wants to come out of that are that they would have this knowledge, spiritual knowledge, that they would know what's right and wrong um, in all of this. And the, result, the ultimate results of all this is that they would be able to discern what's best and that they would have this fruit of righteousness in their lives. So it's going to go somewhere, it's going to produce something in them. So kind of summing up where this um, first bit goes, Paul starts the letter striking a theological tone. He wants this to be deep, and he strikes this theological tone with how he begins with it. He sets out um, 
making it clear that unity is a big piece of what he desires. And growing love and the graciousness and reminding them that they're saints, all of this is part of that. Um, and then he is expressing gratitude for how they've participated with him, supporting him, um, praying with him, and he's providing them encouragement and all of that. That is the introductory piece of this letter. That's how he starts. That's going to set the tone that we're going to get for the whole thing, right? So there's one final thing I want to do today, and that is to just st- stick our toe in the water of the body of this thing. So the introductory piece is done. The Thanksgiving is done. Now we get to the body, and the body's going to go all the way down until we get down to the final uh, part of the book. But we're going to start it today, and I want to look at um, verses 12 through 18 and just talk about those, and then we'll wrap things up. I'm going to read this all at once. Paul goes on in the body. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole praetorium guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brethren have been made confident in the Lord because of my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word of God without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of partisanship, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So Paul is getting into um, saying a number of things. And as as we start this section, um, he's really going to get into now what are the circumstances that he's in? And this goes a little bit back into the format of how these um, letters went. Because at this time, if somebody was writing a letter that was to give their circumstances, and we've got a number of examples of this in other contexts in the Greco-Roman world, but if somebody was writing to talk about what's going on with them and their circumstances, they would have done this introductory piece, the Thanksgiving, and then it was very common to use this exact wording that Paul does of saying, I want you to know that. So Paul does that. I want you to know that. And I want you to know that it's true I'm in prison. It's true I'm about to stand trial and all this. But I want you to know that it's advancing the gospel. There's joy in this. I'm okay. Everything's good because the the gospel is being advanced. Um, His circumstances are good because of that. And he wants us to get this idea that... um, God works through adversity on this, right? The suffering, he's suffering for Christ is a part of his call and that God is using it. And um, he's encouraging others through it. People are getting bold about preaching the gospel. Even these people who aren't on the same page with him about why they're doing it, their motives are different, are preaching the gospel. And he's able to give thanks for that. Like he's not, I think one of the decisions he makes it doesn't say this, but he, you know, he, he's not sitting here going, gosh, you got all these other guys who are all trying to up me or diss me or whatever, but, but you know, they want to show they're better than me or whatever else it is. They're doing other reasons for their preaching the gospel. He could sit there and dwell on that, but that's not what he's doing. He's saying, look, he's, I don't think he's saying motives don't matter, but he's saying, look, for now, I'm just focusing on the good. At the end of the day, the gospel is being preached by more people. So you've got that group, and then you've got these other groups that are being emboldened and are being encouraged, and they're even doing it more so now in view of what's happening to me. So don't be discouraged that I'm in prison. Good things are coming out of it. God uses adversity um, for His purposes. And I think part of this, one of the things you're going to keep seeing coming up in this book, in part has to do with suffering, because again, Paul's writing from prison. But I don't think Paul is trying to give an answer about suffering. I don't think he's trying to say suffering is from God. I don't think he's trying to say any of that. I think, But I would think he is saying is that God can use it, that God can use good things out of adversity. And I think many of us in the room know that, that God can bring good things out of that, and it can advance the gospel. And that's something that Paul will come back and say again and again leads us to joy. If we're all about wanting to see God's love and mercy and grace of the gospel get spread, as we see that, it brings us joy. And that's one of the notes he's going to hit in this first chapter. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you uh, for this letter to the Philippians. And as we begin to look at it, we pray you would teach us in it. And Lord, um, none of us want to be in prison, about to face trial that could result in our death. Um, 
but we admire Paul and his ability to have joy in that place. And Lord, we want that kind of joy in our own lives, that whatever our circumstances are, that we would know a joy that comes from you and, and uh, doing the things you'd have us do. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.